God speaks to us in scripture, and as we are able, we stand in reverence to consider his word today. The reading is a familiar and beloved passage, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us be in an attitude of prayer together. O oh Lord, indeed, may the meditations of our hearts and our thoughts be acceptable in your sight, because we do sense your spirit here the prayers and through the praises and the songs and the liturgy. Oh, you are alive and well, and we are grateful. And now, Lord, comes the time where you've given me the amazing and humbling privilege of preaching your word to these, my friends, and your servants. And Lord, I ask you to speak to me and through me in such a way that all of us here gain a word from you that will make a difference to our lives. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, today I begin a new message series, We Believe, what, Christian believe, what Christians Believe and Why It Matters. And so, why this series? Well, first of all, it's for the curious, because in this uh, secular age, we can't assume that everybody who comes to worship is a follower of Christ. Some people are curious, and you may be one of those people today, and you're always welcome here. You uh, have thought about the Christian faith, maybe you've come to church a few times, but you're just not sure, and you really want to know, what do Christians really believe? And maybe some of you just want clarity. You've been in the church a long time, you've been a follower of Christ a, a long time, but maybe you've gotten to a point where you need to renew your faith, and you've got to sit back and look at the foundations and the fundamentals again and say, what do I really believe? Do I really believe this? And it's also for those who want to communicate. Because maybe uh, you have friends or family who don't believe in God, who don't go to church, but they know you do. And so when they come to you and ask, well, what do you really believe? You really don't know what to say. You don't know how to articulate. Well, I believe this series is going to help you do that. Because if anything, the gospel is meant to be communicated. It's meant to be shared. And you need to know this series is not exhaustive. It would take a a 50-week series to do that, and I don't want to bore you to death. But what I do want to do is I want to focus on those core beliefs of the Christian church that we all can agree upon, that unite us. Because when you look at the history of the Christian church and all the different denominations, you see this split here and this split here and this split here and this split here. And when you learn that history, you discover that what separates all of them are minor things. So I want to focus on what unites us, what brings us together. Those core beliefs. And of course, appropriate today, we begin, we believe in Jesus Christ. As Christians, we are followers of Christ. We believe in Jesus Christ. In fact, one of the oldest creeds of the church, the Apostles' Creed, which we sometimes recite, the majority of that creed is dedicated to Jesus Christ. But do we really know about Jesus? Do we really know who he is? Because think about it, if you say you follow Jesus Christ, what you're saying is you follow a man who lived 2,000 years ago, who was a peasant, who never wrote a book, never held a political office, never visited a city, never went to college, never married, never had, had a family, and died homeless and poor. That's the guy you follow. That's the guy we follow. And yet, when... When a golfer misses a three-foot putt, they scream out his name sometimes. <laughs> Some of them do. I mean, think about it. Have you ever seen a, a, a golfer miss a three-foot putt and say, Thomas Jefferson? <laughs> or maybe here in the South, Robert E. Lee? No. I'm not advocating for it, but some golfers do that. They scream out the name of a man who grew up in a backwoods town to a poor, unwed teenage mother. They scream out the name of a man who died a brutal death as a criminal at the age of 30. 
do we really know Jesus? For some mysterious reason, he's the most influential person in history. More songs have been written about him. More artwork betrays him. More books have been written about him than any other person in history. In fact, our calendar is measured by him. Before he was born and after he was born. Unbelievable. And and you think about his influence, it is just staggering. In fact, when you take a look at uh, the people that he spoke to through the Gospels, when you think about it, he really didn't speak to that many people. In fact, if you count up all the people Jesus probably spoke to, it barely would fill up a stadium that Billy Graham filled. And yet, he changed the course of human history. And a third of the world claims to follow him. Do we really know Jesus? Even Time Magazine, you know, they like to do the person of the year every year, and sometimes that person is debatable, right? I'm not going to go there. But anyway, back in 2013, they decided, you know what, we want to do the doozy. We want want to name the most influential person in history. And so they put together all the analytics that, that Google might do with web pages and looked at the history of people, and on and on and on it went. And guess who won? Jesus Christ. And it wasn't even close. Jesus. Even in pop culture, Jesus is all over the place. Carrie Underwood sings about him. U2 sings about him. Green Day sings about him. Even some of my favorite 80s hard rock groups sing about him. More than 100 movies have been made about him. And you see the books and you see the movies. And even when the Beatles got really popular... John Lennon supposedly said, we're more popular than Jesus now. His influence is staggering. Yet do we really know him? Do you really know Jesus and who he was? I recall the first time I was exposed to Jesus as a kid. I've told you before, I grew up at Wyuka Road Baptist Church here in Atlanta. You know, I was one of those crazy redhead kids that just ran around and drove Dr. Bill Self crazy. When he found out I was a preacher, he almost fell over. (laughs) But there I was as a kid in this Sunday school class, and I was sitting there, you know, eating graham crackers and drinking grape Kool-Aid. It was so good. It's still good. But I remember looking at the wall, and there was this wonderful, idyllic picture of Jesus. He he looked like Kenny Loggins with a smile, you know? Or maybe a member of the Allman Brothers Band, or or maybe Ted Nugent, I don't know. It's funny how we portray Jesus. I bet you didn't think I was going to say that today. Anyway. (laughs) But there he was, and he's smiling, and kids are all around him, and he he looks so warm and kind, and this is the guy who teaches us to be kind to others and and love one another and, and do all that, and it looked great. And yet, as I got older, I began to ask this question, and maybe you have asked it too. How in the world could a man who taught people to be kind and loving be brutally murdered and executed? Do we really know Jesus? Do we really know him? And then my Sunday school teachers, they would teach me about, uh, they would associate Jesus with following the rules and respecting authority and being careful about who you hung out with and Jesus didn't do any of them. He hung out with riffraff, embraced outcasts and misfits, people we wouldn't be caught dead with. And he challenged the religious authorities like crazy. And yet Jesus is betrayed as, follow the rules, take it easy, be careful, and Jesus didn't do any of that. Do we really know Jesus Christ? Do we really know him? But yet many of us claim we believe in him. We believe in Jesus Christ. But what do we believe about him? I mean, what difference does it make that this man lived 2,000 years ago and and, and walked all over Galilee and and, and taught? I mean, can't we just say he was a great teacher and be on our way? What difference does it make that this man lived? I I mean, why is he so important? Does it really make any difference at all? Well, I'll say 
Gospel writers and 2,000 years of Christian tradition say it makes all the difference in the world who this man is. Because as you study Jesus and what he said and what he did, each one of us is faced with a very penetrating question, a pivotal question. And the answer to that question will determine our eternal destiny and the quality of our lives. The answer to that question will determine how we relate to other people, even our enemies. The answer to that question will, will be determined by what kind of purpose we have in life. That question is critical. So to get to that critical question, I want us to take a look at what Jesus actually said about himself. We rarely do that. People talk about Jesus, say things about Jesus, but do we ever look at what Jesus actually said about himself? Because you won't believe it. He made some astonishing claims. First, hear this. In John 10, Jesus says, the Father, the Father and I are one. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus replied, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these are you going to stone me? And the Jews answered, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because though only a human being, you are making yourself God. Now hear that, Jesus claimed he was God. No other religious figure in history claimed that. Buddha never claimed that, Krishna never claimed that, Muhammad never claimed that, Gandhi never claimed that. And any person who says they are God is either a lunatic, out of their gourd nuts, or they're telling the truth. Those are the only two options. But then Jesus says this. When he saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, who is this? Who is speaking blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus claimed to forgive sins. Jesus claimed to take away those things that enslave you and put you in the dark. Jesus claimed to take away those things that pull you down, that drag you down, that suffocate you. Jesus claimed to make you new again. Has anybody ever made that claim to you? Yeah, I'll make you more money. Yeah, I'll get you a better car. Has anyone ever said to you, I can put all your guilt and your shame away and make you new again? And then Jesus claimed this, as we heard earlier. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have what? Eternal life. Jesus claimed to give us power over death. Have you ever feared death? Do you fear death? Do you worry what's on the other side? If there's anything? Do you ever long for a time and a place where there is no pain, no more cancer, no more violence, no more terrorism, no more division? Do you long to live in that healing place? Well, Jesus claims to give it to us. So here you go. Jesus claimed he was God. He claimed to forgive sins. And he claimed to give us eternal life. And when you see that, and when you hear that about Jesus Christ and what he said about himself, it demands a response. You see, that's the thing. The gospel demands a response. The gospel is not some story you hear in church and say, wasn't that a nice story? Let's go get brunch somewhere. It demands a response. But one response that's not in the equation is that Jesus was a great teacher. (laughs) No great teacher would claim the things that Jesus claimed. He's either a lunatic or he's telling the truth. He's out of his gourd nuts or he's the king of kings and lord of lords. So here it is. 
Here's the question each one of us must answer for ourselves. Who is Jesus to you? Not to your grandmother, not to your grandfather, not to your mother, not to your father, not to your friends, not to the southern culture. Who is Jesus to you? And that question, the answer to that question will determine everything. You see, it's personal. It's whether or not you want to be made new again. You want to find life again. To live a life of abundance and healing and joy. But it's also communal. And I tell you, folks, this is a question the Church of Jesus Christ, especially in America, must answer again. Because I tell you, the American church is in crisis. And you want to know why? I'm glad you asked. Because we have allowed hate and division and politics to rule the life of the church. And the the crisis in the American church has nothing to do with being a liberal or a conservative, but it has everything to do with us forgetting what it means to follow Jesus Christ. We need to get back to that. This is seen in something someone said on television, I guess it was a couple years ago, a popular religious personality on television. I'm not going to name the name. That's another sermon. But But he got on television. uh, Someone who says they're a follower of Christ, he got on television and said, America is the great hope of the world. Folks, I don't care if you're a liberal or you're conservative, if you're a Republican or you're a Democrat, if you wear skinny jeans or pleated pants, if you like traditional worship or contemporary worship, whether you're a Baptist, a Methodist, a Catholic, if you believe that a country is the great hope of the world, oh my gosh, you are doomed because only Jesus Christ is the great hope of the world. I mean, what do we think 2,000 years of Christian tradition is? Why do you think we're here? Because Jesus Christ is the help and hope of the world. That's why we're here. So that means every meeting that takes place in this church, every activity that we do, every song that we sing, every sermon that is preached is all about pointing to Jesus Christ, the help and the hope of the world. Do we believe that? Is he your one and only hope? You may say, or, or you may know someone who says, well, Charlie, I believe in God. Well, let me ask you, what God do you believe in? Because maybe some of you who are organized and thinking about the creed, well, why didn't he begin with God? Then you go to Jesus. But the question is, what kind of God do you, do we believe in? Because a lot of people believe in God, but what kind of God is that? The Bible says that Jesus is the visible image of God. John 1.14 says, and the word and Christ became flesh and dwelt among us. Only the Christian faith dares to claim that God came down to show us what he's like. No other religion makes that claim. In every other religion, people are trying to grasp at this divine, mysterious thing, and they don't know the character, and they don't know who this God is, but in Jesus Christ, oh, he comes. And he shows us. I remember just several years ago, I was living in a parsonage at Pasadena, right on the church property. I could tell you some stories. But it was a big house, and it had a big screen porch in the back. And one night, I was taking our dog out. We we used to have a Jack Russell Terrier who was possessed by the devil. (laughs) I tried to perform an exorcism, but 
It just walked out of the room. And so I had to take the dog out and, you know, let, let the dog out in the, the back porch and I opened the door and I heard some rustling. And I turned and there on the, one of the patio chairs was a screech owl just looking at me. And then I noticed that it was stuck because it, it, it started to fly and it was trying to get out, trying to get out, trying to get out, and then it came back to the chair. I was like, well, i got to help this owl because, after all, I'm an expert in owlage or whatever, okay? <laughs> and so I, I said, PJ, which was our dog, come back in. And, of course, Brandy heard me, and she came out with her camera. Oh, look at that owl. Look at that owl. I said, sweetheart, come on. He needs to get out. So, of course, because I'm an expert in owls, what I do is I point to the open door, and I open another door, and I said, ooh, 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 ooh. I was like, okay, I know what I do. And so I actually left the porch. I, I left the, outside the door, and I said, over here, over here, oh, Oh, oh. So surely if I turn on the lights, so I turn on the lights. Go to the light, you know. Didn't do anything. Well, finally, I, I gave up. I had to go back and watch the last 10 minutes of the Great Housewives of Atlanta, I think, or something. <laughs> Not really. But later that night, as I was going up to bed, this preacher said, you know what, this will preach. I mean, when you have to say something original every week, you've got to find a sermon and everything, okay? So I thought, you know what? The only way I could leave this owl and free it is for me to become an owl myself. No, I would look like one crazy-looking owl, wouldn't I? Well, the hair, the hair part is correct, but anyway. <laughs> but that's the only way for me to free that owl and lead him home. And that's exactly what God did for us in Jesus Christ. He became one of us to lead us home to free us. Now, if you're wondering, because I know you're thinking about it, when I got up the next day, the owl was gone. He got out, all right? That's not part of the sermon illustration. Is he crazy? Or Savior? You know what's interesting? That so often in the New Testament, there is one particular word that is always used to describe people's experience of Jesus Christ when they encounter him, when they're affected by him. It's thalma. Thalma. And what does that mean in English? It means wonder, bewilderment, amazement. And this goes for every kind of person, those who are against Jesus or for him, those who didn't understand him, and those who got him. Every time Jesus encountered someone, there was wonder, there was bewilderment, and there came that moment when every person had to decide, am I with him or against him? You see, Jesus will break your heart open and lead you to decide. And maybe that's where you are today. You want to dedicate your life for the first time or rededicate your life. You're sick and tired of things in this world not satisfying, not giving you what you want. Rick Lawrence is a church growth guru. He travels the globe leading workshops on telling churches how to grow. And he wrote the book, The Jesus-Centered Life. And in that book, he tells about the time he, he went to go to a conference to lead a workshop, and he was just 
depressed and sick and tired of his stuff. He's like, I'm just bored with all my PowerPoint stuff and all these gimmicks, gimmicks and techniques and marketing. And he was just low and depressed. And so he got to the workshop he was supposed to lead, and he just threw his notes away and just asked the people there, the pastors there, where have you seen Christ alive and active in your lives and in your church? And he said it was the most electric workshop he had ever led. But then he left that workshop and attended another one and sat there and got depressed again. Gimmick after gimmick, technique after technique, gimmick after gimmick. And he had to leave in the middle of it. He just couldn't stand it. And so he found a comfy chair in the middle of that conference center and he sat in it. And as people were walking by, he prayed, Lord, what is wrong with me? Why am I so low? Why am I so depressed? I'm trying to do your work. And Lawrence said he heard almost audibly from Jesus. Because you're bored with everything but me now. There are not enough golf courses, trips to the lake, football games, cars, prestige, to fill the void that only Jesus can fill. Who is Jesus to you? Is he crazy? Or is he Savior? Let's pray. Perhaps you're one of those folks today who feels led this morning to dedicate your life to Jesus Christ for the first time. Maybe you get it. You finally get it. And you're sick and tired of being sick and tired with this world and your life. And you know there's a better way. Or maybe you're someone here and you want to renew your faith. It's gotten stale. Distractions have come in with work, with other things. And your soul is saying, oh, you need to come back home. Well, if that's where you are, all you have to do is pray silently this prayer with me. Lord, I surrender my life to you. I know you're the only way. The only way to wholeness and healing, to peace, to joy, to purpose, to life. Please forgive me of my sin and fill me with your spirit anew. Empower me and guide me to that way that leads to life. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. And as we do, maybe you'd like to come forward and join this church, to join your witness with our witness as we seek to share the love of Christ in this community. We invite you to come as we stand and sing together.